Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's Neurology Grand Rounds. It is my distinct pleasure to welcome Dr. Florian Eichler, whose work on leukodystrophies has led to breakthroughs in gene therapy for ultra-rare diseases of the nervous system in children and young adults. Dr. Eichler is a professor of neurology at the Massachusetts General Hospital and Harvard Medical School. He serves as the clinical director of the leukodystrophy service, the center of rare neurological disease. He is co-director of the precision therapeutics unit at the center of genomic medicine, fellowship director of the third rock MGH neuroscience fellowship, and he co-directs the fellowship program for neurogenetics and gene therapy with Dr. Steve Haggerty at the MGH. After completing a neurogenetics fellowship at Johns Hopkins and child neurology residency training here at MGH, Dr. Eichler established a laboratory exploring the relationship of mutant genes to specific biochemical defects and neurodegeneration. His laboratory identified neurotoxic desoxysphingoid bases, that's a mouthful, that accumulates in mutant transgenic mice and humans with hereditary sensory neuropathy type 1. This work led to a first clinical trial of substrate supplementation therapy for patients with HNAN1. Dr. Eichler is also the co-PI of the gene therapy trial of adrenal leukodystrophy that reported on first successful outcomes in the New England Journal of Medicine and received FDA approval in September, 2022. For his work, he received the Martin Research Prize from MGH and the Herbert Hart <laughs> Clinical Excellence Award from the Clinical Research Forum. He is also co-PI of the Global Leukodystrophy Initiative Clinical Trials Network, a consortium of scientists working to promote advances in the diagnosis and treatment of leukodystrophies, as well as president of the consortium ALD Connect, a patient-powered research network dedicated to curing ALD. He runs several gene therapy trials at MGH, including for Canavan disease, Tay-Sachs, Sandhoff disease, and Alexander disease, that promise to deliver powerful therapeutic interventions to children and adults changing the natural history of these devastating conditions. Please join me in extending a warm welcome to Dr. Eichler. Uh, thanks, Francisca, and uh, hope everybody can hear me okay. Um, yes, it's an honor to be here, and I just want to uh, make sure everyone understands that I'm actually speaking here on, on behalf of a much larger team uh, today, and uh, what we're doing in clinical trials is really a huge uh, a team effort. So I'm quite humbled to work with many talented people, um, and I'll be relating a work on on their behalf. So my, the learning objectives here are to understand various gene therapy modalities and uh, particularly adverse event profiles, um, and speak to some of the um, challenges uh, today. Here are the disclosures uh, relevant to the talk. I'm founder of gene therapy company and consulted on multiple efforts beyond the PI status on the trials I'll be describing. So um, what I thought I'd do today is describe a little bit how I feel um, about the current status of gene therapy. I, um, I sense we're at a bit of a crossroads in the field of genetic therapies. Um, on the one hand, technology has arrived and, and huge opportunities are available, but the challenges are really growing um, as we are implementing uh, various um, gene therapies. And I've, in my first part of the talk, I'll describe some of the vulnerabilities as I see it, whether it's related to uh, gene therapy as a platform itself versus uh, the disease biology related adverse events. And I'll speak a little bit to how I think precision is impacting both uh, safety and efficacy <laughs> to address that and then go into some um, future considerations. 
Um, so just to set the stage, I think most of you are aware of various different approaches to gene therapy, uh, and I will be focusing mostly here on in vivo gene therapy as a direct delivery AV needed, which um, allows for immediate um, transduction and delivery to target organ versus ex vivo gene therapy, which is an approach that requires harvesting cells uh, from the body, usually uh, bone marrow cells, transfecting them with an antiviral vector, and then delivering these cells back uh, to uh, patients. I'll briefly touch upon some of our efforts with antisense oligonucleotides. So in vivo and ex vivo um, gene delivery use different vectors. On the one hand, for in vivo gene therapy and adeno-associated virus, which is a small DNA uh, virus, which uh, can only carry a smaller cargo compared to lentiviruses, which are larger DNA viruses. And each of these viruses have different tropisms, meaning they target different cell types, have a predisposition to transfecting different cells. Um, lentiviruses are good at uh, transfecting hematopoietic stem cells that allow them for hematopoietic reconstitution in the bone marrow with a lifelong uh, source of corrected gene. Adeno-associated viruses are uh, quite neurotropic, um, and particularly in the uh, early uh, infancy, uh, they, they traverse blood-brain barrier and can go straight to CNS. It's also possible to deliver directly into CNS compartment. <coughs> So while I'll be talking about the vulnerability of gene therapy-related versus disease biology-related events, I think you will see shortly that uh, these kinds of adverse events do not really cleanly fall into one versus another compartment. And what we are actually discovering as we're going into trials is that there is really an interplay between disease biology and the actual um, gene therapy platforms, which makes it very challenging to scale up and uh, do the things that we're actually trying to do right now. First disease I'll talk about is Canavan disease, which is a, a single gene disorder causing a um, spongiform leukodystrophy. This is due to mutations in the gene encoding uh, aspartoacylase, an enzyme that usually breaks down n acetyl aspartate, it spills up and the brain swells. Children have this increasing head size, go ahead control, they never learn to sit up uh, independently. Uh, some can reach for objects, and they uh, develop recalcitrant seizures over time. Um, note that the pathology and clinical picture that actually was described here many decades ago, E.P. Richardson, uh, Maurice Victor, some of this is really reflected on brain MRI. You can see the swelling here on T2-weighted imaging. <laughs> And note that even early areas of the brainstem that usually myelinate very early are already affected very uh, early in infancy together with the cerebellum. And also that NAA and acetyl aspartate can be measured directly on MR spectroscopy. So with that uh, knowledge, uh, Guangping Gao, Dominic Gessler uh, at UMass set up the rationale for an intravenous AV9 ASPA gene delivery in Canavan disease. Um, by optimizing uh, here three generations of AV delivery in a mouse model of Kahneman disease that actually developed spongiform encephalopathy. And they were able to show that even with intravenous delivery, they could prolong survival. And what was quite interesting is to see that even with a targeted, uh, uh, a liver targeted promoter, they were able to extend survival, supporting the notion that actually systemic delivery itself uh, is beneficial for this disease. So we set out uh, about five years ago on a systemic AV9 gene therapy trial in children with Kahneman disease. There's an open-label dose-finding uh, trial in children up to 30 months of age. And so part of the themes that we'll be going through these next sections is how we chose our window and how we were trying to avoid vulnerability to advanced disease, to advanced uh, age. And we have... Um, uh, done mostly low dose at 1.3 times e to the 14th, but uh, vector genomes per kilo, but have recently uh, also advanced to a higher dose. So I want to shout out here, not only to all the coordinators, but also to Dr. Nagy, who's been 
a, a, a real uh, leader in this trial. One of the things we've seen with all of the uh, children we've treated is dramatic immune responses in the first uh, days and weeks after gene therapy. We see platelets drop uh, dramatically. We also see in the coming weeks thereafter a rise in liver function enzymes. And this has really required a lot of uh, clinical work and effort, daily monitoring, and working to uh, get this right. And what, uh, despite using complement inhibitors and other immune knowledge, this has been quite difficult. What has been actually most um, uh, rewarding is using high dose glucocorticoids and improving coverage with both increased dose and longer duration. Despite the immune responses, we've seen dramatic drops in uh, n acetyl aspartate and proof of concept that we are delivering aspartoacylase uh, to these uh, children. We see that uh, in urine NA here on the right uh, drops from the uh, uh, very high levels down into a much lower range that is associated with uh, mild disease and uh, seen in uh, our natural history patients. This occurs not only in urine, we also see this in CSF, as well as on MR spectroscopy, where in reading all patients, the NA levels has been, been dropping. Um, together with that, we have seen resolution of swelling in the brain, but together with that, there's also been a risk of subdurals occurring. And we've seen two uh, patients who, after resolution of the white matter swelling with the intracranial hypotension occurring, this has been a, a really a setup for uh, subdurals that have occurred um, after lumbar punctures. And luckily, ever since we have avoided uh, these uh, subsequent lumbar punctures, this is not being seen. Nevertheless, the most dramatic finding is that um, myelination improves after um, AV9 ASPA delivery, and we see areas of the brain myelinate that we usually do never see myelinate in this uh, devastating progressive condition. You can see here um, at, over the baseline images, patient one, patient two, with increased uh, myelination here on T2 being dark. Here, patient two, not myelinated, and then after delivery, well myelinated on T2 both in the brainstem dorsal regions, as well as the cerebellar peduncles. Patient three, again, same picture, improved myelination here after delivery. Um, uh, to, and, and you can see this recurrent pattern. What happens clinically? So here's a child that could barely uh, sit up on her own. See, she can tripod, then starting to uh, lift her hand to her mouth, starting to show uh, more independence of of sitting, and then at 30 months, she is starting to take first steps. Um, and uh, uh, and last fall, entered preschool, and we recently got a video of uh, her starting to count for her parents. So this was a really quite delightful. Um, so just to summarize this part, the spongiform encephalopathy has, it seems, a permissive blood-brain barrier that allows for systemic AB9 gene delivery. Uh, eight children have been treated at low dose. Recently, we've treated a ninth patient now at, uh, at higher dose, we see dramatic decreases in urine CSF um, and brain NAA, proved myelination. But together with the resolution of swelling, uh, there is now a, a risk that uh, may predispose to subdurals. We have to monitor these children carefully. The immune responses so far have been manageable with steroids. Moving to another devastating disorder of childhood, infantile say Sachs and Sandoff disease, another um, a set of monogenic diseases due to defects in hex A and hex B that perturb second step and gangrene degradation. These are children that, again, um, are so devastated that most of them do not live past the fourth uh, birthday. Only half of these children learn to sit up on their own. All those children that learn to sit up on their own lose that ability within the year. And what we see on pathology is, uh, uh, is really, again, a, a, a diffuse process with uh, intralemular uh, inclusions within the neurons. This disorder has been known for more than 100 years with the char characteristic cherry red spot described by uh, Warren uh, Tay uh, in the UK. So beyond the infantile form of the disorder that I just described, there are uh, later onset forms of the juvenile and uh, late onset adult forms of the disease. These are patients that do learn to walk and talk but have severe uh, ataxia and movement disorders. We set out to really address uh, gene therapy in infants and juvenile patients 
and ask ourselves, how can we achieve widespread delivery of hex A and hex B in uh, these children that are most deficient in enzyme activity? Um, and here we built on work of Miguel Estevez at, uh, at uh, UMass, who provided the rationale for a thalamic ABGM2 delivery, uh, noting that the human thalamus acts as an integrative hub for functional brain networks, and together with the capacity for lysosomal enzymes to achieve cross-correction in neighboring cells, this seemed like a good strategy to, accre uh, to achieve widespread delivery. We set out together with UMass on this uh, uh, um, a B GM2 uh, trial um, and recruited worldwide um, from really every corner of, of the earth. And we're able to, uh, uh, with uh, the help of Dr. Katel Tepe, show that safe delivery into the thalamus was um, possible. We did the neurologic exams and MRIs and at UMass, uh, the uh, delivery and monitoring of immune responses occurred. We have treated patients here at low dose, mid dose, and high dose, and delivery again bilaterally into the thalamus, but also into the intracisternal magna and into the intrathecal uh, space. Um, so in this trial, we're really avoiding systemic uh, uh, delivery, uh, hoping that we can avoid um, immune responses by uh, delivering into the CNS compartment alone. However, what we did see is that systemic leakage still occurs with this delivery into the CNS compartment and is contributing to liver enzyme elevations. And in many cases, this uh, corresponds uh, with uh, interferon gamma positive LA spots. These are uh, 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 really signs of immune responses to the viral mm -hmm. capsid. But what we've seen is that uh, there's often also dissociation between the uh, LA spots, which are these um, uh, signs of T cell reactivity and the actual liver enzyme elevation. So much uh, to learn here. Nevertheless, we see improvement in the biochemistry. We see um, uh, the CSF hex A enzyme activity in Tay Sachs patients rise at low dose and mid dose. We're still waiting for the high dose results to come out. And together with that, we see a lowering of GM2 ganglicides, which is the substrate that is uh, being uh, degraded. By those, uh, by this uh, hex A enzyme activity. So nice proof of concept that delivery into the CNS compartment does in CSF also improve the biochemistry. Um, unfortunately, our juvenile patients who we thought would benefit most because of residual enzyme activity were the ones that were hardest to treat. Many of these patients already came with a variety of presentations, mostly movement disorders, limb dystonia, and many of those patients with limb dystonia actually got worse after treatment and developed general, as you can see in these uh, two rows showing patients over a uh, course of time, showing uh, more generalized dystonia than before. So we asked ourselves, is it possible that our delivery into thalamus uh, was not safe? And here you can see examples of the thalamic delivery um, um, he, uh, in, uh, bilaterally here, and in all of these scenarios, uh, really the, there was no bleeding or no reactions, and the uh, local reaction that occurred resolved over time. So injury to the thalamus itself was not the culprit, and our infantile patients actually tolerated the procedure better and in uh, many, many cases stabilized. What we saw is that the MRI showed resolution of swelling and hyperintensity is particularly here in the caudate, as you can appreciate. Usually these patients only have myelination uh, apparent here in the splenium and the genu of the corpus callosum. And when we see uh, after what we see after treatment is that myelination increases in areas that we usually do not see myelination in, in particular here within the parietal uh, areas, we, uh, subcortical areas, all of a sudden we see myelination um, after uh, gene therapy delivery. What happens clinically? Uh, clinically, a lot of these patients are baseline already quite devastated, but what we have seen is that there occurs some preservation of oral feeding that usually seizes in these patients untreated around a year of age. Now, after treatment is extending up to a year or two uh, beyond that. We've also seen some patients with improved head control, and in this case, patients also 
uh, pulling to stand, yeah, showing yes, an, an improved ability to uh, also uh, have trunk support and some early attempts at sitting. So in short, infantile patients uh, seem to um, benefit from this with some uh, prolonged ability to feed orally. Two infants had clinical stabilization, developmental gains, but juvenile patients are still confounded by dystonia and there's still a lot uh, to learn here uh, beyond the biochemistry and the MRI alone. And we hope that by delving a little deeper into the natural history, uh, we will in the next cycle of gene therapy improve upon these juvenile patients as well. Turning to the um, last trial, I'll describe here briefly uh, one in X-linked adrenal dystrophy. This is another single gene disorder with uh, manifestations ranging from acute brain inflammatory demyelination on this child with cerebral ALD to chronic spinal cord uh, um, degeneration known as adrenal myelinopathy. This is due to mutations in ABCD1 that encodes a peroxisomal half transporter that usually uh, transports very long chain fatty acids into the peroxisome for degradation. A devastating disorder that use, usually when cerebral ALD occurs um, leads to loss of ability to walk and talk within uh, months to years. Most of these patients uh, are, are wheelchair bound and we come up with a, came up with a neurologic function score developed by uh, Jerry Raymond uh, with a, uh, up to 25 points and highlighted major functional disabilities shown here in bold um, in order to capture this rapidly moving devastating disorder. Beyond that, we have the opportunity to use MRI, which really acts as a surrogate of pathology with an MRI severity score developed by Dan Less that measures the degree and extent of, of pathological hyperintense regions. You can see examples of a low less score of one compared to less score of 15 here. And note the really a pathognomonic hallmark of this disease, the garland of contrast enhancement that indicates the active inflammatory phase of disease. Um, what can uh, stop this progression? The only thing that we have known that can halt this relentless progression is the use of bone marrow transplantation that uh, if you used early in the disease course with a well-matched donor can uh, improve uh, survival dramatically. And we think this works because there is a zone of microglial cell loss that surrounds this uh, demonating region like a band um, uh, throughout the um, pathology. And we think that bone marrow derived monocytes after transplantation into the CNS differentiate into microglia expressing uh, a normal ALDP and can rescue this microglial cell loss. What is the downside of bone marrow transplantation? So clearly, bone marrow transplantation comes with risks of poor engraftment of graft versus host disease. And there is a, a huge amount of um, morbidity and also mortality that many families do not want to undergo. So um, we set out to um, perform an ex vivo gene therapy trial for childhood cerebral ALD, where instead of using uh, allogeneic donor cells, we use cells from the boys them themselves. Um, so as soon as a boy was seen who had active cerebral ALD with a garland of contrast enhancement, we harvest uh, the bone marrow cells, transfect them ex vivo with a lentiviral vector, delivering a healthy copy of ABCD1, deliver these cells back to the boys after a brief amount of myeloblation with either cyclophosphamide or fludarabine. And then we follow these boys for a two-year period. It's important to note that actually this procedure is very similar to an allogeneic bone marrow transplantation that has been used for decades, with the difference that we are now using cells from the boys themselves, so autologous cells. And this has been a very nice collaboration with David Williams and Christy Duncan at Boston Children's. And this was first published in 2017, where we reported on the first 17 uh, boys um, who did not have an HLA match donor, and 88% of these patients were alive at 24 months. Two patients died, one from disease progression that began uh, during the pre-transplantation conditioning, and one uh, was withdrawn from the st study to uh, and, and uh, succumbed to an allogeneic bone marrow transplantation. Nevertheless, we were able uh, to, to 
show uh, efficacy and, and proceed to a much larger cohort of uh, now in the combined trial, 67 patients. Half of these patients received cyclophosphamide as um, a myeloablative conditioning, and the other half received fludarabine, a, a less myeloablative uh, conditioning regimen. Long-term efficacy and safety of ex vivo gene therapy uh, uh, is shown here by looking at the MRI severity score. These are um, MRI uh, uh, scores from the baseline over the time period of the trial. And you can see that most um, less scores uh, remain stable. Most of these uh, patients either stabilized immediately after treatment or after 12 to 24 months. Uh, and so 90% were deemed as stable. And a shout out here to the uh, clinical research team that uh, really has uh, done many years of work to make this possible. What happens clinically on a neurologic function score? Remember, this is a score of 0 to 25, with higher scores being worse. Um, um, again, we see 94% achieve stability. There was uh, this patient who uh, was rapidly progressing that I mentioned before, who died from disease progression. Um, but most of the patients uh, achieve uh, stabilization without functional disabilities. Just to show briefly here the timeline of genetic therapies uh, for cerebral ALD, uh, and we were able really to build on the history of bone marrow transplantation um, that started originally at Hopkins and then uh, was um, continued in Paris, where the first successful bone marrow transplantation was shown. Paris, it was also where the first two boys with cerebral ALD received um, ex vivo gene therapy as they did not have a well-matched donor. And, and then uh, Boston Children's and MGH worked together to start a first trial in ex vivo gene therapy um, and uh, accrue patients in the two um, conditioning regimens I mentioned. So things were looking good, and the EMA recommended commercial marketing approval Unfortunately, the sponsor then exited Europe, much to the chagrin of many European families and patients who are still holding a grudge here. Uh, we also then started to see setbacks with myelodysplastic syndrome occurring in the first two patients. Um, and then uh, a third case uh, shortly thereafter, very difficult times for our trial. Nevertheless, the FDA Advisory Committee unanimously approved uh, the uh, ex vivo gene therapy, recognizing that the risk benefit was in favor of using this uh, therapy um, for a devastating disorder as cerebral ALD. And uh, in um, the September of uh, 2022, this became the first FDA approved uh, gene therapy for a leukodystrophy. So, just to summarize, this uh, gene therapy uh, trial for uh, a cerebral ALD. It's important to understand the biological basis for this uh, approach. The microglial cell loss and the open blood-brain barrier allow gene delivery through hematopoietic stem cells. These hematopoietic stem cells have the ability to uh, repopulate uh, this microglial compartment. More than 70 patients with childhood cerebral ALD have so far been treated um, with ex vivo lentiviral gene therapy to date, 94% achieved stable neurologic function without major functional disability. But we are seeing myelodysplastic sy syndrome associated with lentiviral vector related insertion mutagenesis occur and still poorly understood. We also know that patients who are rapidly advancing or who are already symptomatic and progressing remain very vulnerable due to their advancing disease biology. So I'm now going to shift to uh, speaking to some of these challenges around precision and how to um, avoid uh, insertion and mutagenesis, uh, how I uh, think targeting the right cell types for the neurologic disorder at hand is, uh, is critical, and speak to the mutation spectrum versus the clinical spectrum, um, as I see a more need for precision as we learn more about uh, uh, the, uh, the genes we are targeting. So first, to address some of the insertional mutagenesis due to uh, uh, that, that is uh, the root of myelodysplastic syndrome. As I mentioned before, uh, five of the patients uh, with cerebral ALD have shown predominant uh, uh, clones due to lentiviral in insertions. 
in a certain transcription regulators such as MECOM and uh, and um, other oncoproteins. And you can see that megakaryocytes are dysplastic um, and uh, blast formation occurs. And I'm very grateful to be leaning here on the expertise of hematologists and oncologists who will be guiding and teaching here. What's been interesting is that in the five cases of myelodysplastic syndrome we've seen in the uh, uh, um, more than 70 patients we've treated, four of those five cases have occurred with fludarabine, which is the conditioning regimen. And so we are uh, here suspicious that the less mild toxic uh, conditioning is maybe allowing for uh, a, a more um, fertile environment for uh, blast formation, but we still don't understand this well, but have decided in the interim to proceed only with cyclophosphamide as the conditioning regimen. David Williams at Boston Children's has uh, been helping to optimize the antiviral vector design uh, for uh, future trials. We're now moving away from the very strong MND uh, um, promoter to weaker promoters such as PGK and HLA, um, but recognizing well that this proof of concept that going from bone marrow cells to brain to rescue microglia seems to be effective. So I mentioned before that targeting the right cell types is critical. And we know that in even with the same single gene disorders, there are different manifestations and different <laughs> diseases. On the one hand, there is uh, the manifestation of childhood cerebral ALD that occurs in 30 to 40% of boys between the ages of five and 10. But then in adulthood, the predominant uh, disorder is a, not an inflammatory demyelinating disease, but rather uh, a, a dying back axonopathy uh, of the spinal cord known as adrenal myelinopathy. So we decided to, uh, for the, this component of AMN, shift from ex vivo antiviral gene therapy to in vivo gene therapy. And why is that? At the time we started this, which was about uh, 10 years ago, we were carefully watching what was happening in, in the field of spinal muscular atrophy. And many of you probably heard of all, all, um, all of the uh, amazing new treatments that have emerged here. And uh, in particular, we were very interested in what Brian Casper and Jerry Mandel were achieving with AV9 uh, gene delivery to uh, the lower motor neuron. And why we were interested? Why were we interested in this um, this anatomy? Well, it turns out that the um, structures that are vulnerable in adrenal myelopathy are the cortical spinal tract and the dorsal columns that are really immediately adjacent to uh, that lower motor neuron. So, with the help of Casey McGuire, uh, um, Yi Gong was able to um, use uh, an AB9 approach. Where ABCD1 was packaged using a chicken beta actin promoter delivered into mixed glial cell culture and show that she could achieve peroxisome uh, localization. This was actually quite surprising at the time because many people thought we couldn't deliver a gene not only into the cell, but into an, an organelle and in, into the membrane of that organelle and have it be functional. But it turned out that, yes, we could do that. We could show also that in vivo, we delivered into a mouse model of disease and were able to lower very long chain fatty acids that normally accumulate due to this defective um, half transporter. We went on to optimize this approach by uh, developing an intrathecal osmotic pump of AV9 that delivered um, um, into the spinal cord much more efficiently than a, a bone marrow transplantation. Again, supportive of the idea that we needed here an AV approach uh, to target uh, the structures of the axons and the surrounding um, uh, glia rather than bone marrow transplantation. Um, again, we showed biochemical correction that occurred in a dose-dependent manner. What happened to these mice? Usually these mice around a year and a year and a half of age start to develop um, hind limb contractions and clasping behavior. We were able to show that delivery with in, into the ventricles and not only around a year of age, uh, not only early at around five months of age, but also a year of age, was effective in resolving that uh, clasping behavior. And we were able to show that it was occurring because we were delivering into the cell types in the brain that usually express uh, endogenously high levels of ABCD1, namely the basal <laughs> structures. So currently, there is now a trial 
uh, at UMass underway to uh, interrogate this question, whether we can impact gate and balance problems in adrenal myelopathy. This is uh, a run uh, by the UMass group with Bob Brown, Larry Simon, and uh, we're very excited to uh, uh, see um, now the first the three patients having been treated. This being really um, a prototypical hereditary spastic paraplegia, we think this might be important proof of concept that could also guide uh, future uh, patients um, with HSP. And so uh, there's a lot we can learn uh, as we embark on this. Moving from very long chain fatty acid metabolism and paroxysomal disorders now to sphingolipid synthesis, I've um, just to briefly uh, describe the differences in biochemistry as I transition here. So very long chain fatty acids are nothing but long chains of carbon. So if you can imagine adding one carbon to another and that elongation allows for those very long chain fatty acids that then uh, get degraded in the peroxisome. It's different in sphingolipid synthesis where in sphingolipid synthesis, you usually bring together fatty acid with an amino acid. And as you join palmitate with serine, uh, this critical first step of serine palmitol transferase is the one I'll be describing next. Um, and we described uh, years ago that uh, this really bottleneck in sphingolipid synthesis uh, of serine palmitol transferase gives rise to a toxic deoxysphingolipid. This has become a much more interesting and complex field over the past decade. And I've been watching this with fascination uh, to find that various different neurologic diseases arise due to mutations in this enzyme complex of serine palmitol transferase. There are those mutations that we described originally that sit in the binding pocket of where the amino acid docks into the enzyme. This causes red gerocentric and autonomic neuropathy type 1. But there are other mutations in um, SPTLC1 and other parts of this SPT complex that sit in this uh, transmembrane domain that cause complex hereditary spastic paraplegia, as well as juvenile myotrophic lateral sclerosis described by Carson Bonham and others. Um, and so not only is it important to, to make note of where in the mutation, uh, where the gene, the mutation uh, is localized, it causes different phenotypes, but depending on the mutation, serum supplementation can either be beneficial or detrimental. Remember again, the role of this enzyme is to bring together fatty acid with the amino acid serum. So just to take you back a little bit, um, I uh, started some of this work, my wife reminded me 15 years ago, it doesn't seem that long, but uh, it's, uh, it, 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 we first after Bob Brown discovered the gene, we were able to make a mouse model of HSN1 and discovered uh, the uh, lipid, uh, the abnormal lipids of deoxysphingolipids uh, accumulating together with Thorsten Horneman at the University of Zurich. And at that time, it all seemed pretty simple. We were having mutation in the enzymatic complex. This was altering substrate selectivity. This um, enzyme was essentially becoming promiscuous. And instead of taking the normal canonical l serine it was starting to take other amino acids, such as L-alanine. And because it took these <laughs> different amino acids, it started to make uh, these toxic lipids that then um, couldn't be metabolized into uh, into glycosphingolipids and couldn't be degraded. So using the mouse model that we had made, um, we were able to show that uh, supplementing with the canonical uh, L-serine had dramatic impact on these mice and could really improve the mechanical uh, sensitivity uh, of, of these mice. But if you gave them the wrong amino acid, namely L-alanine, not only was the biochemistry changed, but these mice very quickly develop uh, an ulcerating uh, neuropathy. And so with that proof of concept, we were very quickly able to move to an FDA-funded clinical trial on humans. I uh, was very fortunate to work with a very engaged family that allowed me at a family reunion to get proof of concept uh, uh, data. And uh, we, we were able to then subsequently prove that L-serine is truly beneficial, not only to the biochemistry, but also to the clinical picture. Fast forward five, 10 years, we now understand that beyond this binding pocket in, uh, in uh, serine palmitol transfers, 
there is this transmembrane domain that is really important to regulating sphingolipid synthesis and the rate of synthesis of sphingolipids. And what happens is usually there is something of, of, of a, a brake pedal provided by certain proteins called the ORMDL proteins. And these ORMDL proteins usually interact with serine palmitoyl transferase and put the brake pedal on sphingolipid synthesis and stop the uh, synthesis when uh, these sphingolipids are not needed at the same rate before. But in order to do that, they have to interact with a certain subunit of this uh, um, serine palmitoyl transferase called the small subunit A. And we were able to show that mutations in the small subunit A cause a complex form of hereditary spastic paraplegia. And um, we described three families. Two of these families carried mutations, uh, uh, carried point mutations in um, um, the small subunit A of, uh, of serine palmitoyl transferase. And interestingly, these point mutations were exactly at the point where ORMDL, the brake pedal, interacts with the serine palmitoyl transferase a complex in the small subunit. So here, these T51I mutations sat exactly at that interface, telling us really this was now causing uh, dysregulation um, and, and ORMDL was not able to curb and stop sphingolipid synthesis when it, when it was supposed to slow down. Remember that during early development, our brains require lots of sphingolipids, but as soon as myelination started to well, complete, we need to actually slow down this process. You shouldn't be driving at, on the highway at that speed, making more sphingolipids at a certain age. But that is what um, happens when you have this mutation. And lo and behold, if you add serine to this mix, you drive sphingolipid synthesis even higher and create a really uh, toxic uh, amount of sphingolipids. We were able to uh, build a transgenic mouse that recapitulates this uh, human phenotype carrying the T51I mutation. Um, not only do these mice have high uh, sphingolipids, but when you supplement with L-serine, you see an even higher increase in sphingolipids emerge. And uh, this also affects the hind limb clasping that is aggravated by L-serine supplementation. You can see the lower hind limb clasping scores indicating the aggravated uh, hind limb clasping seen in these mice. So we recognized serine was not going to work. Serine was actually really detrimental to these mice. We've been advising patients not to take L-serine. Um, and the same is true for the juvenile ALS patients. There are lots of ALS patients who are asking about serine use. We think this is really not indicated. For our patients with SPTS, the same mutations we now are developing an AV approach uh, together with uh, Casey McGuire, we were able to show that um, we could suppress the high sphingolipid mutation by using uh, a, um, an AV2 SPTSSA delivery. And now we're moving into an, um, in vivo studies in mice to show that um, IV delivery um, in these mice could provide proof of concept of gene addition. So I hope I've been able to show you that precision is key to therapeutic development. Insertional mutagenesis is complex, but preventable target cell types differ by phenotype, uh, neurons versus glial cells in the case of ALD. The location of the defect in the same gene can really matter. In some cases, lead to more of a sensory neuropathy uh, versus um, a more of a motor uh, neuron disease in the case of uh, serine palmitoyl transferase, and that biochemistry provides an early proof of concept and really can guide and help you accelerate your program. So what are the future considerations and things we're thinking about now? I think many of us here in this room are going to, in the next few years, see a whole plethora of new uh, 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 gene therapy trials emerge. But beyond that, there are also now these end of one uh, studies that are really um, challenging us in how to think about uh, uh, engagement and, and whether access options are the right things for our patients, or rather whether we should embark on trials that provide um, better evidence. And this is a constant struggle that we're going through. We have now uh, three um, N of one studies with Enlorem in the pipeline um, using antisense oligos. 
uh, knowing well that there have been tremendous successes in SMA and Dravet syndrome uh, using these antisense uh, sequences that are um, um, uh, complementary to the RNA and can really make a difference. But uh, how much to open up access, knowing that disease biology could be confounding things that we're exposing our patients to risk versus really allowing for the replication, repetition in a trial that provides more robust um, evidence. And you can see where I'm leaning with this. I'll describe briefly Alexander disease as the last trial uh, that we're um, currently undertaking uh, using antisense oligos. Uh, this is for uh, patients with infantile and juvenile disease uh, due to mutations in GFAP. These infants usually have macrocephaly, regression, seizures, but juvenile patients uh, learn to walk and talk and then um, uh, have headaches, vomiting, dysarthria. Many of these patients have brainstem lesions that can look all the world uh, like brainstem gliomas or MS patients. And in these, uh, all these cases, we see mutant GFAP <laughs> the filamentous protein of astrocytes accumulate as part of Rosenthal fibers. And Albie Messing, a few years ago, was able to provide proof of concept in a mouse as well as a rat model of Alexander's disease that using antisense oligonucleotides could knock down uh, GFAP. Importantly, this was a non-allele specific approach, meaning that he was not only knocking down the mutant GFAP, but also the wild type GFAP. But in, uh, he was able to show that this was well tolerated postnatally and led to a reduction in Rosenthal fibers. And this has allowed us to embark on the first uh, uh, trial as a multicenter uh, placebo controlled study in uh, intrathecal antisense oligos um, treated, used in Alexander disease patients. And you can see here first patients treated in TCRC. Again, uh, this takes a village, and I'm, I'm really grateful to all the help of coordinators and, and, uh, and, and uh, child neurologists who are um, helping along the way. Just to summarize the ongoing trial for Alexander's disease. It really is um, investigating whether the Rosenthal fibers caused by mutant GFAP can be targeted with an intrathecal antisense oligo. It's an international worldwide study, placebo controlled, re aiming to understand whether we can improve or stabilize gross motor function in patients with Alexander's disease. What else have we learned? Um, coming back to bone marrow transplantation, I, uh, we, a few years ago, I was able to uh, detect in a, uh, a man who came to me with progressive cognitive deterioration, motor problems, um, that he did not have the presumed diagnosis of metachromatic leukodystrophy that his sister um, uh, had was thought to have. She had, with that misdiagnosis, undergone uh, hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. And uh, interestingly, when we did whole exome on this entire family, because I couldn't find sulfatides in the in the man. Uh, accumulating, we were able to show that the mother was actually mosaic for mutations in CSF1R, and uh, the patient who had benefited from the bone marrow transplantation, she was now chimeric, um, she, uh, for the first time demonstrating that in an adult leukodystrophy, um, we were able to uh, use bone marrow transplantation to impact the neurologic progression. Um, this has now led to efforts using gene editing together with the guidance of Ben Kleinstever, Jasna Mitovich, and Yeda uh, uh, Lee have been uh, working on uh, uh, correcting um, CSF1R mutations using a, a cytosine base editor. And the hope is here that we can now extend the work that has been done in fibroblasts to, um, to hematopoietic stem cells, similar to the work with uh, childhood cerebral ALD. The advantage of this gene editing approach is that we can really precisely correct it, um, knowing well that if we have too much CSF1R, we might uh, get to lymphoma and leukemia, but if we have too little of it, this leads to um, uh, adult uh, onset leukodystrophies. So I hope I've been able to show you that AAV-based gene therapy approaches, as well as lentiviral ex vivo gene therapy approaches are here to stay for uh, the leukodystrophies. This has already had a tremendous impact in metachromatic leukodystrophy and childhood triple ALD. 
But antisense oligonucleotides are also emerging, as we see in the field of Alexander's disease. And um, depending on what cell type is affected, you need to choose your modality carefully. If the blood-brain barrier is open, if microglia are defective, think of ex vivo antiviral gene therapy. If you're really aiming for neurons and uh, want to uh, achieve direct delivery, use an AV approach as in our TASACs and, and Sandhoff trial. There are many safety aspects and managing treatment complications is key. We've seen that myelodysplastic syndrome emerges uh, with lentiviruses, thrombotic microangiopathy, um, and liver inflammation can occur with AV administration. We know that also after intrathecal administration, there can be complications, uh, not just post-LP headache, but a whole host of other things that our team has uh, now experienced in. We have an MGB Neurogenetics and Gene Therapy Fellowship together with Dr. Vic Corana at the Brigham, and uh, we're uh, um, glad to have all the support uh, here um, by administration. We have now three fellows on board and another three um, applicants in the wing. So um, what I've learned is that really we need uh, more education in this field because we can't do this alone. It really takes a village. New genetic medicines are uh, really entering and genome editing will come with as a huge wave. Uh, the adverse events we are seeing are really not um, so predictable based on the platform alone, but rather they result from a unique interplay of technology and disease biology. And this is what we unfortunately need to learn disease by disease. Even with the same single gene disorder, different phenotypes may require targeting different compartments, cell types, and I hope I've convince you that precision has implications for both safety and efficacy. Ultimately, the vulnerability of patients informs risk stratification, and that's why I think we as neurologists are really the gatekeepers for some of this precision medicine that is emerging. So I just want to acknowledge all the patients uh, and families that put their trust in us, and uh, it's been a, 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 a a wonderful journey together and a lot of learning and i'm 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 grateful to all the people who participated and um ventured into this uncertainty uh together and so i I've tried to acknowledge everybody along the way but i'm sure that many people have also left out but uh, thanks to everyone Yeah, so it's a key, key question, um, Andy. So I um, I guess I would see this as glass half full rather than half empty. I, I think there's a huge opportunity to accelerate uh, based on learning from each other, but it is not uh, driven by the technology platform alone. And I think that's the message I'm trying to convey. And I think there is a huge role for uh, us neurologists in the tradition of neurology and neuropathology to go back to our roots and really understand all the things, the great things that people have looked at, E.P. Richardson and before, to really inform what we're doing, right? Uh, what I'm very wary of is the one-size-fits-all approach where we start to say, oh, this platform is the fastest moving car, that is just apply it, uh, without paying attention to the substrate that we are delivering to. And so I don't think it's just holding us back. I actually think there are huge opportunities to move fast. You know, we watch SMA, we 
moved very quickly. I think understanding the biochemistry of some disorders, I was able to move very quickly from mouse uh, to human. I don't think it's necessarily the entire regulatory playbook that we always have to engage in. FDA is actually very open to faster, accelerated paths. If you showed me and if you have proof of concept uh, around mechanism, I don't know if that helps. It's amazing uh, how many diseases you're targeting in different strategies and also how many uh, young colleagues are training and involving is very interesting tracking and training. The next generation of experts is working out on genetic. So, the question is, is about the role of my DNA of me, as you pointed out. And we have missed that on how you and colleagues discover that even my DNA is affected before the other side or the myelin itself. And how we compare. Uh, Discoveries that come from human data versus discoveries that come from mice and animal model. How they interplay the speed of discovery and the complexity of the process. Yeah, no, good question. So, maybe two quick things. I, I think uh, serendipity plays a huge role in some of these discoveries. I uh, um, went to Cleveland Clinic actually to work with Richard Ranzoff, thinking I was going to. And, you know, study T cell responses in in in, in cerebral ALB, and um, I, I I brought a whole uh, trunk of uh, brain autopsies with me uh, just to find out that actually uh, it's the microglia that were dying and looking very different than in the MS samples that Richard had uh, at, at Cleveland, and so that really made me start thinking about uh, a, a vulnerability here. Now, how do we know the temporal sequence? It was really the zonal pathology that occurs, where uh, the the most the outermost part of the of the pathology was the dying microglia, and those were the areas that the demyelination was um, advanced <laughs> uh, into. Um, so, I I think um, I address at least one part of your question. So, around the microglia, remind me. Uh, that compares to the speaking, you have to create, or you have to learn. Oh, yes, yes. So, so in terms of animal model use, I will say a lot of the experiences that we have in trials were not predicted through the animal model use. So, I, I've been a little wary of, of, you know, going into preclinical mouse models for all too long. Um, many of the immune responses we do not see, you know, some of the um, mechanistic aspects of. Uh, impact upon, um, you know, intracranial hypotension not seen in the uh, Canavan mouse model. Um, you know, similarly, I think some of the connectivity of the human scale is just not well predicted. So I think I'm a deep believer in understanding uh, risk stratification and unmet need and moving quickly into humans and then being very vigilant about what you're learning because the preclinical models only go so far. Thank you so much for an amazing talk. My question is um, related to each of the treatments. So I think it's slightly the longevity of the mission that is coming to you. I was told that the earlier you wait for more energy or more viral clinical markers. How do you think about approaching patients that have very Conditions where later on the genome of this of these conditions came back. Yeah. And where is their, where is the one role that the gene therapy played of the approach to these changes? Yeah. Yeah. So, so, uh, two quick comments. So, as soon as we find proof of concept that something works and can be safely implemented, what we've tried to do is really establish newborn screening so that we can get to patients as quickly as possible. And this has really, um, you know, worked perfectly for cerebral ALD, where we now have newborn screening across the country, and we're now able to monitor patients early on before disease arrives. But you're right. 
there is a huge problem still with those patients that are too advanced and how can we serve them? Um, and I think the way to think of this is we have to acknowledge that living for years, if not decades with a gene defect is not the same thing as seeing that gene defect at conception. And we have to acknowledge alterations in plasticity, adaptation that has occurred, and understand what is that environment that we're delivering into. And I think once we start to shift the paradigm there, we will be better. You know, is it, are we ever going to solve it? Probably not, but we're going to do right by the patients. 